Attention all FD fans. If you are heading to an event this year, I've got an easy way for you to save yourself five bucks. So when you go to pick up tickets for any of the eight events, that's any of them, Long Beach, you know, Seattle, Atlanta, whatever it is that you want to go to, at checkout, use the code FD Podcast. It'll save you five bucks doing this for the 20th season. So head over, use the coupon code, save yourself some money, and I will I'll see you out there. Maybe you'll see me walking around. I don't know. If you do, say hi. Tell me, hey, I saved five bucks. If you want to give me that five bucks, I, I'm okay with that too. All right, guys, welcome back to the official Formula Drift podcast. Uh, today we have our our champion. We've got Mr. Frederick Osbo on. Thank you for uh, setting aside some time to to jump on and have a quick chat. Absolutely, I'm excited. So you're the season is uh, around the corner, um, <laughs> and I'm pretty pretty um, stoked at this moment because I I I've been a little bit. Uh, um, I want to say off the radar a little bit this winter. I know. And now I'm getting back in the groove. That's that's been like just just getting this arranged. It's been like you know these cryptic messages. I'm here, and then I'm going to be here, and then I'll be there. And it's like uh, yeah. it's like where in the world is Frederick Osbo? But I mean, I think it's I think you you need that downtime though, right? Like that little bit of get back to quote unquote normalcy or do something that's not specific to you know racing. Although from my understanding, you're still doing a lot of that too. Yeah, I mean it's on and off, but I come, you know, come December, I just need to shut off. I need to get away from cars. I need to do anything but drifting. Um, you know, th- this is not a a physical sport, but it's a very mental sport, and it definitely it takes a lot out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know different drivers deal with it in different ways, but I I definitely need to just get as far away from drif- drifting as I can and come back hungry for the next year. So you're, without giving away like total locations, you're in Sweden right now? No, dude, I'm in Norway. You're in Norway, okay, okay. I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> No, but, but, but I am going to Sweden to, tomorrow, actually. Right, So, right. Uh, um, And, you know, the, the joke is that, uh, you know, Norway, the Norwegians and the Swedes are brothers and sisters, but there's a little bit of rivalry, so that's why... You know, whatever. It's a touchy subject. Yeah, when you put it that way. I, I know because like it's a similar situation with with us Canadians and Americans, where it's like you know, there's some competitive rivalry there in, in things like sports and and like there's jokes back and forth. I mean, uh, with with tourism stuff and just culture stuff, where like it's very similar, but it's also very different. So, and, yeah. and my limited amount of time in Norway, I've, I've kind of learned that there's some, there's some fun songs from the Norwegians to the Swedish and back and forth. And, uh, yeah, I've been, yeah. been slowly picking up on all those, uh, cultural divides, but it seems, it seems like a fun yeah. rivalry though. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And we, fact of the matter is we love Sweden. We, we go there all the time for ice drifting, which is what we're going to do tomorrow. Nice. Um, I have a lot of friends in Sweden. There was a point in time where I was perhaps trying to marry a Swedish girl, you know? So I, 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 I've been considering moving to Sweden even, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, there, there's some cultural differences and we're lucky to, we're lucky to live in Norway. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of, of good social uh, advantages, I guess. It's a rich country and all that, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know. I, I feel like we're kind of similar to Canada, except we have less cool cars and uh, we're further away from the U.S. Yeah, sadly, we, we we definitely we have like the 15 year import rule instead of the 25. So you know, mm-hmm. when R34s became legal in Canada, it became like this whole cottage industry of all these Canadians importing them you know, cleaning them up, storing them, and literally just waiting for the day that the U.S. 10 years later would open it up. So now you have all these R34s sitting on the border ready to go as soon as they're legal in the U.S., Uh, especially after the whole, you know, uh, Florida import of R34s and then those all getting scrapped and all that stuff. People realize like, oh, I can just sit on these and and just wait until they're legal. And then if people want them, they don't have to import from Japan. They just, you know, drive up through Detroit and come into Canada and they're ready to go. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, so nice. ice drifting. So how would you, I mean, I, 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 <clears throat> I just came back from, from Norway, did a little bit of ice drifting. I've done a little bit here in Canada as well. How, I guess, how much would you accredit that to, to your ability now? Like training in the off season is difficult from anybody that has quote unquote seasons. You know, the, the, the SoCal guys kind of have the benefit of being able to drive pretty much all year. Florida, very similar. Texas, you know, same thing, but obviously you and 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 people in in the northern territories <clears throat> you've had to adapt and and do ice drifting which is similar 
but also very different in, in regards of card control. Yeah, um, I, so I think any kind of seed time is good, right? Any way, in shape, or form that you can practice is good. But the, the, the problem with a lot of the, the practice that we get to do is that it is in pretty low-grip cars. <clears throat> Right. Because it's so expensive to, to run the, the, a pro car with a, a pro car level of grip. You know, you need the sickest tires, the craziest tires, like the ones we're in FD. You need basically the drive chain and everything to match it. So that uh, a lot of drift drivers around the world end up practicing in cars that don't drive like the pro cars do. Because right. obviously we're running so much grip and competition these days that the cars are really hard to drive. And it's a very uh, awkward uh, feeling of, of a, a sensation of grip in those cars. Mm -hmm. And you may not believe this, and, and people listening may also not believe this, but these <clears throat> low horsepower ice cars that we run with these tires that we run provide a feeling and a sensation of grip and sort of like a, a ramp, a grip ramp that's very similar to a pro car. That's why I think the, the certain style of ice driving we do is beneficial. Yeah, it seems to be, obviously, with like the larger like WRC studs, that the moment you come off throttle, you're, it tries to straighten. It tries to grab. It tries to pull the car straight, which is very similar to you know, a pro-level car. Although, I mean, I've never driven those. It, it's just something I've observed where it's like, um, if you're not on throttle, you're not on the handbrake, you're not actively causing the car to you know, lose traction, they immediately want to drive straight. And, and ice seems exactly. to, with these WRC's uh, tires, seems to be very similar. Yep, and that's exactly how, uh, how an FT car is set up. Yeah. There's a lot of understeer in a pro car these days. And um, the more you can replicate that, obviously the better. And the, the sensation of grip is where on ice, it's very loose around the center, mm -hmm. but the more G's you pull, the more you dig the studs into the ice and the more grip you have which is the opposite of a, of a typical grassroots car on tarmac where right. you have the most amount of grip before you're actually sideways. After that, it's a, it's a reducing rate of grip, right? So those are, that's the technical reason why we do the, this type of ice driving and just the amount of seat time we can get out of, a, out of a set of those tires is unparalleled. You know, we get hundreds, hundreds of laps mm -hmm. in a day. And in, in, you know, a typical track day in the summer, you, maybe you get, I don't know, 20, 30, you know? Yeah. And you go through 20 tires. So it, it, it's a lot of bang for the buck and a lot of fun. And these ice drifting trips, we do end up being these social gatherings, you know? And it's a total, and pardon my language here, it's a total dick measuring contest yeah. between everyone trying to... Oh. Yeah, one up each other, and I love it. I love that part of the camaraderie and the competition, and you know that whole setup. <laughs> are you are you find you're you're chasing more in these situations as opposed to leading? Because it's like you now um, it's something that like I, I've I've talked to other FD drivers about where they say, you know, part of the fun of these festivals and and different things that we get to do is that we get to chase drivers with less experience who are maybe mm -hmm. less predictable, that are less calculated. So it's causing you to be on your toes constantly. Is that, is that something that you can, I guess, attest to? Absolutely. Amen to that. Because yeah. the, the more you can kind of follow someone that you can't trust, the more, you, you, like you said, you're on your toes and you, you're, you work on, on your reactions and your planning and how to cope with different curveballs that get thrown at you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we all want to chase so a lot of times on, on these uh, ice drift trips, we all end up in a situation where we all want to chase. So it's sort of like a gentleman's agreement where we all swap positions, right? Mm -hmm. Try and chase each other. A lot of times, a lot of the new guys are down to lead more because they're new and maybe not as comfortable in chase and that end, ends up working out well for everyone. Uh, so it's, it's sort of this like cycle of... People come in, coming into this whole thing, getting absolutely bit and and hooked on the drug, and yeah. uh, now going all in and buying these crazy expensive tires, and now they're they can't wait for winter. It's I mean it's it's just interesting to hear how how different people have adapted to that, like the the issue of of weather and snow and training. You know, we have a lot of people that go into sim sim drifting. 
which I, I think is a, is a massive benefit, but there's certain parts to that that you just can't, that, that can never come across. The, the inertia feeling, you know, you, uh, for me, like I am not a good sim drifter at all. And it's, and it's because I've realized that I need to feel the moment of grip. And, and if I don't feel that, mm-hmm. I don't know when to transition. I don't know when to use my pedals. Like I don't, uh, I, and by no means am I a talented drifter. Um, but I realized very quickly that Great was drift. the issue. A, a little bit. I, I'm not going to toot my own horn here in front of, you know, in, in front of the audience. But um, it's just, it, that was a, an aha moment for me that somebody else had to explain. They're like, well, you suck at sim drifting because you're so used to feeling the car. Whereas in sim drifting, yeah. you need to more or less anticipate what it's going to do. Uh, which, mm-hmm. you know, there's a benefit to, to both sides of that. Yep. I agree, and I, I work closely with um, Simagic, um, who's a manufacturer of, of, of electronics mm-hmm. and PlaySeat, and I'm I'm an ambassador. But I I'm a little bit ashamed because I don't get to to spend that much time on the sim because I end up prioritizing real life drifting instead. Mm-hmm. But I totally agree with you. Going from uh, having all these different forms of sensory input, r- like up through your spine, feeling G-forces, all that stuff, and now relying on visual, mm-hmm. it's it's a different style of driving. And that's why uh, that's why I think it, it's, like you said, it's a good tool, but it's not the... You can't only sim drift and become a good uh, competition drifter. Yeah. And I think there's a big... There's many, many ways of sim drifting, too. If you want to practice... Um, for competition, it doesn't help that much to just do solo runs and practice and free practice and hitting the restart button and all that. Mm-hmm. You got to actually compete in, in one of the online series. Well, and at that <clears throat> point, you're learning racecraft, which is perhaps even more important than the driving practice itself. Yeah, it's it's so much more mental than than what people I think maybe give it credit for. Like it is so heavily mental. Like you really, you yeah. really. To get into the zone, to get into that that focus point. I mean, um, just doing media over the years and seeing a lot of in car footage and and just working with drivers, I've seen it. I've seen like you know the the thousand yard stare of a driver before they go to the line, or even like just talking themselves up or you know hitting their helmets. I've seen guys who are like have headphones in, they're trying to listen to music. Do you, do you? What I guess what 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 gets you in that mental space? Like what's that ritual like? You know, before the line or even you know getting into the weekend. So I've worked a lot on this, and it's it's one of my uh, it's been one of my um, my big priorities is to really learn the mental game and figure out what works for me. And um, I'm I guess I come across as being kind of stoic and kind of just calm, mm-hmm. uh, and it's true. I there's a time and a place for for everything. I can rage and party too, oh, and, I know. <laughs> and be social and yeah and, and all that, but it, but not pre race. Mm-hmm. So. It starts a week prior, no partying, no drinking, no alcohol a week prior to, to an FD event. Okay. Um, I try and stick to, to food and stuff that I know, not necessarily super healthy, but just kind of basic boring stuff. Yeah. Um, keep it chill, keep it easy, save energy in a sense. Um, and then come race day, I, you know, I just take it easy. I don't hyper focus on on the driving or the track, or I have some notes on, on the tracks of how I want to do things. But when it's we start getting close to actually driving, I walk to track, I figure out my markers, and two minutes before I go, that's when I start going through my little plan of attack. Okay. But it's nothing crazy, it's nothing hyper complex, it's maybe four or five different little points that I want to hit, and that's that. And the biggest thing, is understanding that it's okay to screw up. Ah. I had a point in my career where I, I um, uh, so this was probably 10 years ago when I started driving for staff and started getting into FD, where I wanted it too much. I was too aggressive. I uh, pushed myself too hard and I made a bunch of mistakes. Now, uh, be, simply because I, I felt like I could not screw up. It was not okay to screw up. And after I realized, you know what, it's okay to screw up. Then everything came together in such a a, a strange way. Mm -hmm. Because now I wasn't hyper-focusing on not screwing up. I was instead focusing on the tasks I needed, I wanted to do, and just try to do them as good as I could. And if that was enough for 10th place, okay. If it was enough for 20th place, okay. If it was enough for a win, then that was great. But... 
So is it like setting aside the competitive mindset or just like retuning that mentality? Like, because I know you're competitive and I've seen it. It's just, it seems like it, it was it was more of a shift where it's like, I'm going to take that energy and kind of forgive myself ahead of time, but still have yep. the drive. Exactly. That's what it was. Okay. And is that, and it, you know, I was going to say, is that something like, where did, where did that come from? Is that like, you know, Steph has a huge storied career of, of um, import drag racing and, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people uh, kind of gloss over is like how mm-hmm. accredited he was before he ever even touched a mm-hmm. drift car. Um, mm-hmm. Is that something that came down from him or from somebody else? Or like, when was that aha moment? So Steph and I talk about many things. We, we talk about a lot of things, be it girls or uh, chain reactor. Like we, like we, we, every, every FD weekend, we had sort of kind of, we have a topic that we all discuss, okay. which is not drifting related, which is big nerds, yeah. right? But this particular thing with the mental strength and the mental game of racing, didn't, I didn't get that from him. That was me instead figuring it out on my own. And I started talking to ski jumpers in Norway. Oh, They do something that's similar, except they have you know, way bigger balls than we do. Because they sit there and they wait for hours and then they jump 200 yards, yeah. you know? But they have the same kind of uh, challenge that we do. They got to be on point when they go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned a little bit from them. I started reading... Uh, stick and ball, uh, sports psychology. Okay. Uh, and just, you know, sort of kind of being curious and figuring out, looking at how other people did it, looking at what other people did in other sports. And and it was actually Justin Pollock that guided me on to some of those really? uh, books. So I, I owe a lot to Justin for that. I never would have put those two together. Like, not if you yeah, could have right? gave me the whole roster and I never would have said Justin. And that's so cool. And because, and, and, these are the things that I think a lot of that a lot of people obviously don't know about in the sport. How we're yeah. all we're all competitors, but there are, there are some weird friendships forming and some weird forms of respect and passing down of intel and mm-hmm. know how. That's that I think is really cool and fascinating. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've seen it um, with you specifically with with Simon and Ula. Like, it's it's interesting to see. You know, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a mentorship by any means, but like there is a lot of respect from those two drivers up to you. And and I've seen conversations you guys have had and just like even just cheering up after a rough event or congratulating after a great event. And like, I think something like that is 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 kind of a given just coming from the same culture. But I've also seen it with you and, and other drivers that I wasn't like expecting, just like going up and tapping somebody on the back, like, hey, this is and, and like, you know, good job or hey, you know, sorry, this happened. It it is interesting how that I guess doesn't get covered, and and I think it's maybe just there's not enough of an outlet. I mean, that's part of the reason why this right. is happening is to provide that. But um, yeah. is there, is there any other like fun connections like that that maybe people wouldn't wouldn't know about? Well, my mom was hitting on Dai Yoshihara. No once. way. Uh, <laughs> well, I say that jokingly, I know, but I know. you know. But there's there's all kinds, uh, you know. The, the first guy to introduce me to an FD sponsor when I was fresh off the boat, my first day in the U.S. whatsoever, 2008 at the Sea Mush. I was walking around like, f- you know, a fish out of water. Yeah. And Conrad Grunewald was the, the first okay. FD driver to introduce me to, to uh, some of the tire manufacturers. Oh, that's so, cool. So, yeah. So things like that are. are are cool, you know. Obviously, I, I have a great friendship with uh, Jonathan Castro. Right. He's actually staying here at my house right now. Right, he's going to Sweden with us tomorrow. Um, what a change up for him! We're so <laughs> yeah, we're we're so different, right? Mm-hmm. Like in every way, we're different. Yeah, and I think that's what's so cool. He's so good at all the things that I'm not good at, <laughs> and he's a lovely, lovely host for my wife and I when we we're visiting. And you know, it, it's it's. Those thing, those friendships are a big part of the package that is drifting to me. Right. Yeah, I think that I, I think that's you know something people forget about. We want to focus on rivalries. We want to focus on you know all these these troubled incidents or whatever. But it's like at the end of the day, like even even after things occur that that are people are upset about. I mean, there's still so much camaraderie in the pits. Like that's. I think the if if you've never been to an FD event, like just go walk in the pits and observe. 
Like just yeah. from a distance, watch the interactions because there's so much that goes on and occurs and, you know, Chelsea riding around on his bike and stopping in at pits and just hanging out with people for forever. And then you see, you know, Ryan Sage walking around, he gets pulled in somewhere and Kevin Wells, <clears throat> that dude can barely walk 20 feet before he's getting pulled in for, you know, somebody asking a question. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it definitely is, I, I mean, uh, from my perspective, it's definitely one of my my favorite parts of, of FD in general. Like the racing is fantastic, yeah. but everything the moment the track goes cold is kind of what keeps me coming back. Totally. So. And I, that's that's racing, right? Yeah. Like people are, we're there, we're ultra competitive, all of us. We all want to win. We all, we're, we're putting everything we got into it. We all want to, we, we all want to beat the next guy, but we don't want to kill him. Yeah. We're friends. We want to, we want to compete on equal terms and just, you know, and, and I think, in in the midst of all of these rivalries and competitions and battles, there I at least I feel that it is this way. There's a lot of respect for and credit where credits due. Mm -hmm. It may not always be said, it may not always be talked about, but there is respect from all the drivers to the other drivers, uh, depending on 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 their performance. You know. Yeah, I think. And it, and that's, I think that's part of the driving factor for a lot of us is to kind of like see if we can, can we hang with this guy? Can we, you know, can yeah. we, that, that was always my driving factor, seeing if I could go, go up against the best and maybe I could have something on him, you know, and now I'm one of their, one of them, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of are it, but uh, <laughs> spe like speaking with, with but, newer guys, I mean, that's, that's always been their thing where it's like. They know they've gained respect from from I, I guess the the old guard or or the you know however you want to break down the generations of drivers in FD, um, but they'll say like in practice if X driver runs my door I know he respects me, like I know sure. I know you know if, 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 practice seems to be that feeling out point where you'll line up you know let's say a younger guy runs. And they say, oh, you know, this driver, I can use you as an example because you're sitting right in front of me. But like, you know, Freddie was right on my door the whole time. Like, I take that as a sign of trust and respect that he knows I'm going to lay down a really good run and, and do that. And I also know some of that is just you in particular going like, well, I may have to run against this guy. So I need to know what he's going to do. Well, if I had someone run my door, I would feel like I wasn't fast enough. <laughs> But, I mean, well, but, I mean, maybe not like push them around the track, but like not, right. not, not like give sure. them, you know, six car lengths to then follow where it's like, sure. no, this sure. guy's legitimately trying to, to tandem with me. I guess run the doors. Sure. Maybe I, the I see. Term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, for sure. I, and I, I, I kind of feel like I have to apologize because I'm so in the, my mind is so in the realm of hyper competitiveness and so that when when I'll, so a lot of people, a lot of young drifters, a lot of new kids on the block, a lot of people that are, are just getting into drifting, they they come up to me and the, or send me messages, to ask about this and that and this and that. And sometimes I I find myself in a situation where my response is it doesn't make sense to them because mm. I'm so in the ultra level of competitiveness that they they they're not even dipping their feet in yet and yeah. here I am talking about the difference between anti-squat and squat and you know what I mean yeah so and I'm that's the level of nerd I am yeah you know <laughs> and and the level of, of of that's the stuff I'm into and you know back in the day I, I when people ask me how to make it in drifting I used to say I used to give them a long spiel on you got to go to local track, got to do this, got to work on sponsors here, got to do this, got to, you know, I gave them this whole list. Yeah. These days, I simply tell them, if you, if your drive to become a pro drifter is so strong that you, you dream about it, you think of it, think about it every waking hour of the day, where you spend all your money building a basic drift car, at, then you may have a shot. Mm. If you don't have that drive, I, I think it's very hard to get there. It's So it's similar. Um, I worked in kitchens for 10 years, um, and people would come to me, and, and, and this is the only way I can relate to this at all, but people would come to me and be like, oh, mm. like, I really want to work in kitchens, and I would sit down and have like a hard talk with them because it's not a great lifestyle. It's a very, very difficult career path. You know, It's long hours, long weekends, it's similar in, in the regards of 
high pressure, high stress when it comes to competitive yep. racing. I know it's not like a one to one, but it's the best I can do. And I would t- yeah. I would tell people like if I can talk you out of it in this conversation, you wouldn't have made it. But if we can end this right. conversation, if I can tell you about all the hardships, about the crazy hours right. and and the the immense amount of pressure and stress and heat and and yelling and screaming and all the BS surrounding it, if I can talk you out of it now, you weren't going to make it. Like sorry. Right. And and right. I'm sure there's probably great people that I talked out of doing it, but I, I think it's I think it's similar to what you said. Like you have to, it has to be like every waking moment, and that's what's going to get you. It's 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 what's going to make you talk about it. It's going to get you in front of sponsors because like that's always the hardest part. I would say from from that perspective is the sponsorship game because it's it's not easy, and oftentimes it's it's more about who you know than anything else or what connection you made or what discussion you had. I mean, obviously your driving ability is what's going to get you across the line, but but mm-hmm. that conversation, that introduction kind of needs to happen first. I mean, um, yeah. Is there like is there any tips you would have for young drivers on that regard of like like maybe how you got in because you you kind of came over with almost nothing and then have built this career off of that. Like it's <laughs> It's a cool, it's a really yeah. great story. Well, yeah, and uh, so the the big milestone here is when I started working with Steph, mm-hmm. which also was was it was an interesting way that, uh, you know, that happened, but Steph wanted me to drive for him because of because of that uncompromised drive to succeed. I could care less about how my rookie car looked. I could care less about anything except trying to win a battle on, out on that darn track. Yeah. And I think that's what he saw. It was, that was, the, the, that was the, the only thing that was on our, our minds. And when I say our minds, I, I mean my, my guys from Norway and myself, and we were you know just total rookies, and we didn't have the experience or anything, but we did have that drive, almost like an unparalleled drive. And looking back, obviously all of the teams in FD are driven, but we were just possessed yeah you know and when Steph asked me to drive for him I almost said no because I was so hell-bent on beating him oh that's that's it interesting what a turning point right so when Steph gave me that call that winter after we had spent all of my scholarship for school and welfare money or whatever we had in our pockets in, in FD. He gave me a call that winter, winter of 2010, 2011. He yeah. said, hey, Freddie, Tanner is going to move on to Rallycross and we want you to drive for us. Any drifter in the world, no one would say no to that. Yeah. Right? But I, I said, Steph, that's, first I got speechless, right? Yeah. And then after, after I kind of recollect myself, I was like, all right, Steph, this is, an amazing opportunity. Let me talk to my people. And I sat down. I put together a list of opportunities and and threats and opp- Pros advantages and, cons, yeah. and disadvantages. A SWOT analysis yeah. over that proposal, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And, and now you're talking uh, my language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's what it is. Yeah. And and there there were a lot of you know I didn't believe in the car they were building for the next year. I didn't believe in certain things and blah blah blah, but. And, and at that point, we had gotten a sponsorship of $80,000, and we thought we were rich. You know, we were, we were going to build our own Supra for the next year yeah. and try and beat everybody <laughs> on that $80,000 budget and all that stuff. But the big, the, the big point, the big conclusion at the bottom was, imagine what you can learn from working with a guy like Steph right. and his team. <clears throat> and that's why we did it. And... It's, you know, all of those disadvantages, many of those disadvantages actually turn out to be true. We were struggling the next year. I was not up to up to speed. I had a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. But the car also wasn't great. We had a lot of chemistry we needed to figure out. But after that, after like a big dip, we started building. Okay. Because, yeah, that's tough. There's like obviously, you know, you coming from from running your own program at that point in time, you know, a little bit of, of cultural divide, probably a little bit of a language barrier that's there as well. And then, you know, I, I'm sure you had those moments like, oh, I just, just let me do it myself. Like, let me just, let me just, like, I'll fix this thing, right? And then you have to put that aside to be like, no, I have to communicate this to who is doing that job. Like, I have to now 
work less yeah. like I'm just going to fix the problem to I need to tell people how I need them to fix the problem for me. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. All, all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, but it's, it, in, in hindsight, it's been such a, a great journey to learn so much from Steph and Sean and Aldo and Mario and everyone yeah. and just about life. And, but, but at the same time, I'm, I feel like I'm on the same trajectory. It's not like we, we've only done well in the US, we've done well elsewhere too, in Japan yeah. with RSR and in, in Asia and in Europe. And, and, and I think I'm, I've never thought I'm the greatest driver out there. And I, 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 to this day, definitely don't think I'm the greatest driver. But I do think I have some skills in, in putting together the package and, and that race craft we're talking mm -hmm. about. That's, that's, what I, that's where I like to, to put my effort. That's, yeah, I think that's, that's good. So question on that regard. How much would you... Uh, how much credit would you give vacuum sales to your drifting career now? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Uh, oh yeah, the vacuums. Okay, so <laughs> somebody, yeah, okay, uh, everybody, everybody listening right now is like, "Hang on, what? What did he just say?" Some people will know, what? which is good, but for everybody yeah. else, when I was 18 years old um, and got my license here in Norway, I had a beat up old Volvo 360 yeah. that was painted blue. I bought it for 300 bucks or 3000 kroner here. And I had my, uh, I was driving around selling vacuum cleaners <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it was a tough job, but, uh, the best part about that job is, and I gotta be careful what I say here, mm -hmm. but we were driving to all these different spots mm -hmm. and, you know, all of us sellers were going out at the same time. You know, we all had a, at individual calls, but they were all in the same regions. We were racing a little bit. At night, we were out drifting, you know, on these deserted industrial lots. And, you know, I the vacuum sales themselves didn't really help the drifting, but the skill of learning how to sell yeah. has definitely helped, you know, because understanding how money works, understanding how to sell something is definitely a skill that comes in handy in racing. Um, and some of those photos I have of that Volvo, I'm not sure if you can add them here, but I'll see what they, I can do. they're pretty hilarious. Yeah. I look like it. I already look like a total dork. <laughs> I had, I'd seen a few. I mean, obviously, just uh, uh, my little bit of time in Norway a few weeks ago, I was able to to do a little bit, little bit of digging. So it was. Uh, I see. Uh, oh yeah. yeah I see. Oh yeah. No, I wanted to, wanted to do some some research, you know, with the with the locals. Okay. So that was the one story. I've, every time I asked, I was like, "What should I ask Freddie? Like, if I'm gonna have him on, what should I ask? <gasps> ask him about vacuum cleaners." I'm like, "What?" And they're like, "Just I, just ask." <laughs> so some of the people we showed up to. Uh, so I was 18 years old in school. And a call center booked those appointments, and they basically told these old ladies, "Okay, there's a guy that's going to show up with a box of chocolates," and okay. that was it. They never said anything about vacuum cleaner sales. <laughs> so some of these ladies I showed up to, they some of them just wanted a someone to talk to. Oh, okay. And I remember going to this one lady, this this you know middle aged woman, kind of milfing it up there, and and I was you know trying to sweet talk her into buying this vacuum cleaner and her husband comes in <laughs> i got thrown the f out that was uh yeah i'm sure you drove away pretty quick pretty after bad. that oh yeah oh yeah oh that's that's funny it's yeah I, I i was hoping it was a good story i'm glad uh, i'm definitely glad it, it was so so <laughs> yeah. one one thing that a lot of people don't know and i i learned firsthand uh this past summer is that you were very much into djing so if right. you have, you know, if you're opening a set, let, let's say you're the main act, wherever, what, what, are the, what are the first three songs you're going to play to get that audience going? And I, I'm sure it's location dependent, but... Okay. Let's... Yeah, so, so full disclaimer, I'm not a pro DJ. I know. And I've never done this. Well, but I've done some, like, I've warmed up for some I mean, local DJs. You were on main stage at Gatville this summer. Of, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But that was... I, yeah, that was cool. That was that cool. Was, that was cool. <laughs> But, but I would, okay, so I'm kind of like, um, I have my own taste. I, I, I like, what is it Hunter calls it? My wife, she calls it African music. Okay. So I like it kind of funky and like, okay. uh, 
you know, deep house with some bongo drums and like kind of like excited. Imagine, imagine you're at the beach somewhere in Greece or in Spain or in Ibiza or something like mm-hmm. that. I like that style of like house music, um, but I also like um, uh, you know you, you got to have rhythm as a dancer in there. You got to have some of the '90s hits, of course. Maybe some Rufus, Del Sol, maybe some. There, there's a local deep house guy here in Norway called Finn the Bussen. Okay, like super like underground, deep, dirty. <laughs> so I like that stuff, but I you know. Whitney Houston, Belinda Carlisle, I'll throw all that stuff in there. It's just fun. The, the whole attraction is, for me, is the, the cre- creativity. Okay. Uh, you know, there's no set recipe. You can kind of mix whatever. And also uh, teasing and seeing what people like. Oh. And I think that's the, the, the entertainer gene. You know, being a race car driver, you kind of, a part of that is liking to entertain people. Uh, and and maybe it's all of that coming together, and it's also a way for me to just let my mind loose and not, you know, just yeah, let the creative juices flow. Just just disconnect a, a little bit, but like it's that exactly. in tune with the audience where like you can play a song and you're like, oh, they're like they're starting to dance a little bit. Okay, so now I know the vein that yep. I need to travel down to to get them to to move, and then it's like, okay, everyone looks a little exactly. tired. Let's give them a break and and slow it down, and then. Kind of, I mean, exactly. that, that's what makes a, a successful DJ is, is reading, reading the room, really. Exactly. So, And that's where I don't have a lot of experience. And, and you know, usually it goes from you, you learn how to DJ, you play your own songs, whatever you, you like, mm-hmm. right? And then you kind of test that on people. Maybe that doesn't stick. And then you learn how to really understand what people uh, like. And, and a friend of mine is a, is a really good DJ. He's like, if you don't play any of the top 40 songs in your sets you're a little bit stupid mm. it's like, right yeah it's like a hack right it's just like the, people yeah, are gonna, you, gonna yeah they're gonna react to it most likely someone out there in the crowd are, they, they're gonna like one of the top 40 songs mm. so, so you just like sure kind of hook them in with them. that and then start to add your yeah. own stuff and like introduce that and, yeah okay yeah. just sneaking in and you kind of and and he and he also said he plays a lot of dinner parties that turn into full-blown scandinavian style dancing on the table uh, nightclub yeah. parties. Yeah, you guys go hard. And he says it's always about luring the people in. Like he'll, he'll do a set that starts during dinner, and he'll see he'll see everyone sit there, and he plays a lot of, of stuff with you know without vocal, mm-hmm. and then he'll start you know adding some more beats, and then you'll see people like starting to dig it, you know, and eventually they they let go and they start dancing it's during like, dinner. Just like I I feel like I can't remember it was a. Uh, uh, a musician, I can't remember who it was, but like they talked about, you know, finding the person at the back of the room and just like that's who I'm performing for. Like once I get you moving, gotcha. then I've yep. succeeded. So uh, that's a good. That makes sense. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I, hey, yeah. I, I as as someone who has has attended one of your your dance dinner parties, I mean, I, I had a great time, and I'm not a dancer, but I, it didn't Wait, take. Wait, when long. was that? That was at Gatville. That was at the the large dinner oh, in the tent. You were there. I was there. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it was a great time. That's right. I. I, yeah, I have photos I, I have and videos my, that I'll, uh, I'll never have to, can never release. Oh, there's the whole setup. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember sending a, a photo back home to a couple of friends. I'm like, you'll never guess what just happened. And they're like, what? I'm like, I'm eating dinner, <laughs> and Frederick Osbo walks in with the DJ set, puts on a set of headphones, and just blocks out the world. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, he's just <laughs> he's just going. Like, it's just, it, it was great. So, is it? Yeah, how, that was fun. I get, like, how important is that kind of stuff to to the racing mentality? Like, we talked about you disconnecting in December. Like, is there is there other things that you're doing to to kind of like disconnect um, and 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 try well, and regain, you know, that that energy? Yeah. Back? Well, th- that particular set I got to be actually ruined next day's competitive edge because <laughs> I really sucked the next day. But <laughs> that's all right. But I. I like I said earlier. I like to you know check out in December if I can. Yeah. Uh, in November, I, we go off roading in, in California. I I used to surf uh, a bit, not so much over the last couple of years. Kind of want to go get back to that. I was just on a skiing trip or snowboarding trip with my buddies, so I try and do just other things. And and I'm not super good at it. I'm not like. I'm not. I'm not really an adventurer so much. Okay. Uh, so I'm not. 
I guess just not that exciting, I guess. But I, I, I do like to really let loose sometimes and like just, I make sure to stay in touch with my old friends and, and just do something completely opposite of drifting. And I think that's, it's, it's all about uh, peaking when it matters <clears throat> in competition. Right, being as hungry, the the right, uh, being feeling the pressure and being hungry, but not too hungry, and like lining everything up for for those eight events. Yeah, it's and and trying to cycle that. I remember hearing something about you when you're booking your flights, like you know, trying to to get ahead of like the jet lag, so you you would fly over yeah. to Japan. Um, so you're right. you're running the time zones in in, in a different way. So that way you don't right. have these crazy six, seven hour shifts, right? Yeah, ideally, I'd like to go west. Okay. I'm not a morning person, so I, <laughs> I'm a lot better at like extending the day. So I like to go west. So ideally for me, if let's say I come from Europe and I, I do something in the States and a race in the States, ideally, instead of flying from the States back to Europe, I'd go to Japan for three, four days. Okay. And uh, or Hawaii or something or somewhere for that way. Yeah. Um, and I've done that a few times, but it's easier said than done. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a, like logistically, it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. I mean, right. Is it and, like, how much does, cause we talked about Castro, but like how much does the, the travel commitment, especially being somebody who, who travels as much as you do, how much does that play into it? Cause like there are drivers who, you know, for the majority of the rounds that like, there's going to be little to no time shift, you know, maybe they, they only have to drive a couple hours or take a two hour flight. Like, do you, do you think that weighs a lot heavier on on these international drivers? Like that's it's always been my thought with Castro. Maybe I'm gonna ha- I want to have him on and ask him that. Like because I I I not that I know his schedule, but like I've seen it where he's shown up in the morning, got in the car, and gone. I'm like there has to be a detriment to that to not acclimatizing a little. Sure, but then again, Castro's also on Eastern time. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, so so it's a long it's long it's. Long travel, but the time zone change isn't really that much. Right. So I don't, I don't really think it. If you do it right, and you, and you make sure, and you and you learn how your body works, and figure out what works for you, you can probably compete uh, close to one hundred percent even after a long travel like that. Mm. Uh, but for me, it, it's it's about a lot more than that. It's a, it's about what you, what you've done the weeks prior. Are you rested? Are you okay? Can you focus on the race exclusively? Are you motivated? You know, those things I think make a bigger difference. Um, and of course, the whole, I, it, there's a lot of luck or a lot of, of maybe not so, just luck, but a lot of, of variables that mm-hmm. just need to line up for you to do well. And, you know, be a car setup being, you know, we all want to hit the ground running. Can we avoid? Uh, crashes in practice, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's all of these things need to line up to do well. And sure, being rested is part of it. But it's what we do, you know, traveling around the world like that, it's not really any better or worse than being a shift worker. Fair. You know? Yeah. Um, that's a good way of putting it. Which isn't healthy, <clears throat> yeah. but a lot of people do it. No, that's fair. Um, speaking of car setup, so you have run, you got, you, you've been basically on the cutting edge of, of what. I guess was possible with, with a lot of these cars, like, you know, being one of the first guys in the A90, obviously everything going on with the Corolla, like how, I guess, how much does Steph put into it to make the car feel the same or all these cars so vastly different? Like, what's that learning curve? Like, like I, I can't even begin to understand what it's like to get into something like the Corolla and be like, Oh, I have no overhang over my rear wheels. Like I literally have to put the wheel into the wall for me to have proximity. Like, is there is there a learning curve to that? Is there something that you're doing testing to to understand the limits of that car? I'm like, how I it, it just feels like every time you get a new car, you're like, oh no, we're we're fine, it's perfect. Like, I'll just go. Um, and I'm trying to understand how that happens. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we, for starters, we try and match the ergonomics okay. of whatever I like. So, so like, seat position. Okay. Got it. Yeah, seat position and positioning of pedals and steering wheel and all that stuff. And to some extent, the pivot of the car, the center part of the car, okay. we would try and match that too. But it's not always feasible. I mean, look at the Supra. You're going to sit way further back mm-hmm. than you would in the Corolla. Yeah. So it just doesn't... The cars feel different, period. 
And the rest of it is, it's not so much, the, the rest of the car is just trying to get it as competitive as possible within the, the parameters that we believe in. Um, and the cool thing about um, adapting these front-wheel drive cars to work in FD is that it teaches you a lot about uh, dynamics and geometry. And it teaches, instead of, instead of starting off with a car that's great, uh, let's say a, a Corvette or something rear-wheel drive, yeah. <clears throat> with, with these rear-wheel drive cars, we had to really figure out what makes a car good. And that's taught us a lot that we can now utilize in other cars, right? Yeah. And the flip side of that is that the Corolla and, and the TC <clears throat> and the IM, they were all much better chassis than you would think. Hmm. Uh, the, the suspension design is actually very similar to, uh, to an E46. Okay. <clears throat> So, so they they lend themselves nicely to to the sport and what we're doing. Like you said, the the uh, overhang is always going to be a disadvantage. Uh, you know, twenty eighteen. You know, part of why we lost the title that year was due to the overhang and me not having the crush zone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so but then again, uh, that's one disadvantage. But there's a lot of other advantages with that car. And that car, you know, as Ryan Ryan drives the, the crap out of that thing, yeah. and, and it takes it, and he does really really well. So it's a great car, and I think that's part of the attraction of drifting to me is that all these different chassis and all these different theories and, and ideas of, of building the best setup, they all work. You know, look, last year that there was tons of different cars on top of the podium, and mm-hmm. you know, that there's it's very re- very rare to see that in motorsports these days. Yeah, it's usually like one chassis that'll that'll dominate, and then that's you know, kind of everybody moves towards that, and then it becomes this <clears throat> more or less yep. homologated looking field. Whereas, you know, yep. the the history of of FD, we've seen so many you know, quote unquote, obscure vehicles over the years. It's that is that is definitely one of the most exciting parts to it for sure. I mean, the, the Corolla yeah. definitely looks snappy. It looks like it, it you know it comes and transitions to angle very quickly, whereas something like the Supra, uh, not that it looks lazy, lazier in comparison, um, but it, it seems to have maybe a more predictable look to it. Um, I, I, that was always the thing I've noticed with the Corolla. It seems like it requires a fair bit of input to kind of keep it where it needs to be. Whereas the Supra, yeah. to me at least, is not a set it and forget it. But if there are input changes, they're not as noticeable in the chassis. Mm. Okay. At, at least yeah. from the outside perspective. I mean, I don't know what it's like in the car. Um, I've seen a lot of your inboard uh, footage, and you you very much seem to be a okay. I know exactly where I need to catch this wheel, and then set into it. And then when the when the run goes perfectly, it's like oh no, and I'm just holding here, and this is this is how it goes. Um, I mean, mm. it just obviously it depends on the run. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I think a lot of what we, what we perceive on the stream and watching these cars, it's colored by so many different things. Right. It's affected by wheel color, livery color, the sound, the run, the the visual size or overhang of the car, the offset, there's all kinds of things playing into all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the black art of drifting, right? Like, Mm. it doesn't matter how it feels inside the car. It only matters what the judges think of it. That's all that matters, right? Is is there like a play to that then? Like, is there is there like an advantage in in potentially a livery color or like it being reflective and maybe how that's perceived by judges? I mean, I Maybe okay. I don't know. Like, I mean, the the classical example is black wheels, to where perhaps you you can't see brake checkups, right? Or maybe a white front wheel, so you can see the angle better, right? It's uh, like I, Steph, I guess all of that plays in. Steph to me is the kind of guy that would would make those decisions. Like I remember seeing some aero changes. I think it was on the Corolla, and mm-hmm. I and maybe I once again maybe I'm over analyzing the hell out of this, but. It looked like the decisions that were made in Arrow were to direct smoke as far back away from the the cockpit as possible. And the, my initial thought is like, oh, it's it's to make sure the cabin is clear so everybody can see because that that can be a massive issue if you don't build the car correctly of of smoking yourself out. But then, like the way it looked, I'm like, ah, oh, it's kind of like going back towards the chase driver. Like, is there? 
you know. What, what were the? What was that arrow? So I believe it was the, the rear bumper and the Corolla. There was a set of slits added, and then there was a a small piece added to the rear bumper that that looked like it was almost built to funnel the smoke directly back. Okay, so you're onto something, but it was not to funnel smoke out the back. Okay, so so cutting up the bumper is just to to let the air out okay. and heat. You know, we have the cooler back there, and obviously, the more we can get the smoke out, obviously, the better. Uh, it doesn't stick to the inside and all that stuff. Right. The the wings on the side was to try and make the car visually longer. Oh. So that's totally that was totally. Interesting. But that was the that was the play was to try and make the car visually longer because we didn't have the overhang. Oh, okay. Well, I'm so glad I caught it, but little, for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. So, but we went away and it kind of looked. A, cheesy and you know it's it's another thing to fix and and keep track of and and everything else right yeah and if and if you really look at our cars we're not we're advanced in many ways but we're also not that advanced in other ways mm-hmm. we we don't have a good crush zone in the back we could do so much more with the back corners of the supra you know we have sort of like a stock pandem kit with all these different layers and it's all relatively hard, and you know that we're not we're not really Steph is not devious or, or like he's <laughs> we're, we're we're looking to improve on everything we can, yeah. But we're also not trying to like sneak one in everywhere we can, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and you know one of the things that Steph would say it's it's not beneficial to anyone that one team keeps winning. So he's well aware. Of, of like the gentleman's agreement of, of the well-funded teams not running away and going batshit crazy with all this R&D and all that stuff. If you look at Steph this winter, and even the past winter, he's out there playing with his old RAV4 yeah. and his Cor- you know? So, so it's, it's, yeah, we're competitive, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. But we're also not pushing it to the absolute limit everywhere we can all the time. Okay. You can, I mean, I... He obviously gets that that I mean label that that he's willing to run the rule book to the tightest edge possible. And I know if if that is the case, he is not the only one. That that is that is racing like in its purest form. It is read the rules and understand <clears throat> where you can fit in the in that rule guide. Right? I mean we right. um we talked with Ryan Lontane about this when James Dean entered and how he read the judging rule book based on proximity and went, "Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to get right in on these guys. I'm going to cut my angle by, you know, 10, 15%, but I'm going to be there the whole time. And they, they had to change judging for him. Uh, they had to change mm-hmm. judging for Daigo Saito because of the way that he was running to, to make sure that, like, this new style is not something that, that is, is going to just take over drifting because that's not what they wanted. So I, I'm sure, mm-hmm. I'm sure there are things that are, that are happening that are right on the ragged edge, but that is happening across the board. Like that can't be just directed at, at one, you know, one team owner or, or mechanic or engineer in, in particular. Right. So um, I think yeah. I joked with Kevin Wells a while ago. I'm like, hey, can you point out like every rule in the rule book and then why that reason is there? Like I, I want a story as to like why this rule is there. Because there's some, there's some fun ones in there that I'm like, there's a story behind this yeah. rule. So. Totally. And the, the, the big, the big uh, equalizer in this sport is the tire. All those Mm -hmm. tires have different strengths and weaknesses, and that's why they can get away with a, um, you know, a motor or, yeah. If you read the rule book regarding motors, it's open; can do whatever you want. Yeah, right. And that's so that's the beauty of it, because then it's kind of self-governing. As long as he keeps track of the of the tires and a couple other things, then it it seems to play out sort of evenly, right? you know, you look at the last three years, and Nitto now have having won what is it three years in a row? Yeah, um, and uh, it, it's. I think that Nitto now they're they're a little bit like okay, we're 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 stoked. We got those three, those three uh, championships, but maybe we will pause developing at this point. Mm-hmm. It's almost like there's a there's an 
gentleman's agreement with all the tire manufacturers where, okay, this year, this tire company is allowed to make a new tire model. Now right. this tire company, three years later, this tire company can make a new one. Now this tire company. And it's all kind of a balance of performance in a sense. Because um, if, if we were... If we're all on the ragged edge of developing and, and trying to make the cars faster and faster and faster, we'd be like, we'd be like drift masters. Where right now there's some you know discrepancy and discussions you know behind the curtains where it's such a grip game. Yeah. It's it, oh, there's only really one tire that can win. So I feel like I honestly feel like FD's done a good job of keeping performance in check. Hey everybody, Jacob here from the Formula Drift Podcast. We have an awesome deal for you. So if you head over to shopfd.com and use coupon code PODCAST23, you're going to save 20% on any merch. So anything you can find on that website, use PODCAST23 at shopfd.com. Save yourself 20%. Hats, shirts, lanyards, wh whatever. Just, just use the code. Save yourself some money. So why not? You know, don't, don't stop listening. Wait till the show's done. But then head over, shopfd.com. Use podcast 23. We'll see you guys out there. And allowing such a diverse field of cars and tires to to play. Yeah, th those <clears throat> those nittos are are crazy. I mean, I, I talked about it in, in another episode, but just the moment I saw them, the moment I saw that the way that the sidewall was built, the way that they squatted, the way that they rolled, like I was like, oh, this is this is a new era. Like this is this is something completely yeah. different. Because um I am I am shamelessly I, I love slow motion, tight shots of tires. Sure. That, that's like, yeah. if there's anything I'm going to watch all day is because I want to see what they're doing in action. And it's, it's a very difficult shot to get as a videographer. Um, but after seeing those tires in action and understanding that like the sidewall is built to kind of come under and become the new contact patch and you see the way the tread mm. wraps, like that's what it's meant to do. That guy, I remember seeing that for the first time going like, oh, <clears throat> we're either going to see these things completely run away or everybody is going to start developing in this similar path. And I mean, I'm still kind of waiting for other people to catch up. But, but as you said, if Nitto is no that, longer pushing things forward, that now gives everybody a fence post to more or less catch up on. And, and they don't, they don't need to develop more. They've proven themselves. So it's like, why spend more money to keep running further ahead? Right. Right. And I, you know, it's a fantastic tire. I love it. And it's really fun to drive on. <laughs> yeah. But it's not like it's, it, it's not like it's uh, it, it's miles ahead everywhere. Some you know we've lost uh, several battles this year where others have had a better setup. Mm -hmm. You know, in in rain we haven't always been that strong. Uh, you know, it's a wider tire, meaning you have to weigh more. Mm -hmm. So you know, slowing down. Now you have a heavier car. So it's not like it's an extreme. It's just a like you said a different tire where I think that that G two the NT five hundred five G two that we run on yeah where it really excels is on corner exit because of oh. all that tire patch interesting but everywhere else it's more of a wash or, or sometimes because of the weight we have more of a disadvantage so there are tons of great tires in the sport but what's cool about NATO is them you know being there in FD doing every everything else that we do be it off road and street and all that stuff and. Yeah, definitely have some good fun with them out in the dunes too. I, I was gonna say, do you have a lot of you know uh, commitments on that that side of things? Like, obviously, as as FD grows, as motorsport grows, I mean, I I feel like we're gonna start seeing hopefully FD kind of move towards the F one model of like a lot more commitments as as hopefully brands jump on FD and kind of discover it a bit more and realize like, oh, this has a ravenous fan base of you know, this age demographic and it's growing um, and it's in comparison budget wise is like super minimal, even compared to like NASCAR, or Indy or anything, yeah. even karting. I've seen budgets yep. for karting that, that far surpass an FD budget. Um, yep. But, but on, on, I guess coming back to my, my question is like, do you have a lot of these commitments outside of FD that you, you have to schedule and, and work around that, you know, add to, to what you're doing? <clears throat> it's, it's, Pretty, it's not too much. Okay. Um, and I, I'd love to do more, at least certain things I'd love to do more of. What's been really fun the last couple of years is doing some um, uh, commercial shoots with uh, Toyota. So we've done, you know, actually national TV campaigns. And I think it's really cool how Toyota's, uh, they have some 
they have some fun on their own behalf. Right. You know, the the pitch where we where it's like a a, a fake Toyota boardroom meeting where they're talking about how to market the the GR cars and you know, we've done some cool stuff with with those things, driving inside shopping malls and in roundabouts in LA. And, yeah, you and posted stuff like a, that. You posted a video about that, talking about like how yeah. minimal the front grip was and like how difficult it was to drive in that that mall. Yeah. Again, th- there's so much push in these FT cars. You, people <laughs> don't understand until they've tried it. Uh, but um, yeah, on those tiles in that shopping mall, yeah. obviously all, the grip level was low, but it was far lower in the front than the rear. Uh, so, but we've done stuff like that. NATO's pretty easy going. With we, we don't really do much. They just want us to try and win, you yeah. know. And we, we're trying. And uh, Rockstar's cool. So we did a big thing with Angus Cloud at Irwindale, which was fun. Yeah, he's such a character he, from Euphoria, the the actor. Mm-hmm. I taught him how to drift, and I almost threw up in the passenger seat. Are you not a good passenger either? Oh, I suck. Oh, dude. every I, every pro driver yeah, I've talked to is like, it. I hate it. I can't stand it. I don't like it. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> the, if I ride with someone I trust, it's okay. Okay. But the problem is, a lot of times you expect a car to do something, and the uh, journalist or whoever is driving does the opposite. That's when, you know, your tummy goes, "Oh, this is not cool." That's funny. Ah, oh, it's. I yeah. just. I think that's one of those common threads. Like, I don't know if I've met. Uh, an elite level driver that's like totally fine being a passenger. So we're big wimps. People think we're ad- adrenaline junkies now. We're big wimps. Do we're you, just sitting there protected by cages. And, do you still yeah. get that adrenaline hit? Like, or are you actively suppressing that? I don't feel like I'm suppressing it. I I get it. I, but I'm I'm not an adrenaline adrenaline junkie to begin with. Okay. I'm a a nerd that likes. As a kid, I like to sit in my butt and play with Legos, right? And that's sort of kind of what I'm doing now, except <laughs> we're playing with cars instead. Okay. And uh, but I get my adrenaline. I think when I get that release is when we do well on track. Like when let's take Atlanta last year. We won Atlanta. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's great to win. It's super fun, and I'm stoked. But the reason why I'm stoked is not because we won. It's because everything was right. You know, we we had the right amount of catch into. The hairpin, the gearing was just right. The spread was right down the hill into the left hander. Had it, you know, got got it to to catch at the right moment. Shot up the hill. Everything was right. Mm-hmm. That's the fun part. That's what's cool. Okay. And sometimes you could feel better about a, a, an event where you got knocked out in top eight if you made huge progress that weekend. You can feel better about that than an actual win that wasn't deserved. Mm-hmm. And last year was a little bit like that because we won the championship now two years in a row, and 21 felt deserved. Felt like we did a good job. I didn't make big mistakes. It felt, you know, we we all collectively as a team did a good job. Last year, I made several mistakes, and I was I had a little dip mid season. Yeah, and it's we didn't. Overall, we didn't do that great of a job. It's just that the other guys did a worse job, like, or or had more bad luck, or yeah. or just didn't play out for Not them. Not that they didn't and drive well. Matt, just, just a, yeah, I was gonna say Matt. Matt, that yeah. was a rough year. Like it was his but best Matt, and worst but, year at the same time. Yeah, the, the year as a whole was great because he did such a good job for six events there. It was everyone. It, it was like it was written on the wall. Matt was taking it. He did. It, it was like clockwork. The six first events, he was on point. Stellar job. Yeah. Come round seven, started falling apart a little bit. Round eight, it all fell apart. Yeah. So it turns around so quickly, and that's why I felt the, you know, at Irvingdale when everything was said and done, it didn't feel right to, to like it didn't feel right. Uh, we'll yeah. take it, and we're stoked about winning, but it didn't feel like the year before. It just it didn't have the same, I guess, like build up. It was it was it was kind of anticlimactic. Like it was yeah. it was a weird ending. It was a very unsure ending. We were like, oh, okay, this is yeah. kind of it. Like I I guess it's I guess it's over now. So yeah, yeah. Which I mean, like the fan in me wanted that to happen. Like I I needed you guys to go head to head. I mean, literally, the season started with controversy, and, and I apologize for getting into this because like. But it, I think it needs That's to be said, like that, the season begun with with conflict, and it built this 
incredible story. I mean, you know, you're chasing, you were, it was literally an inch. It, it, that, that's what caused that accident with you and Matt is one inch. Like you watch it and like, it was the, the smallest a bump, but in these cars, same thing. It just, it, that's all it takes, especially at that track. Like that track, there is no moment. forgiveness there. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah, it would have been, it just would have been phenomenal to see that come to fruition at the last round and, and everything else, you know, come together. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Can, I agree. Can, can I ask like what, with, with that incident, I mean, I, I was standing there, I was standing literally right where Matt went into. Um, obviously crash happens. You get out of your car immediately. First thing you did is check on Matt. Cause like that, you're like, are you okay? Obviously he's upset. The Instagram situation happens. I, I guess like, what was that timeline like with you? Were you like, is that something you knew about right away? Cause Matt took it down pretty quick. But like, did right. you, did somebody tell you about that? Did you hear about that? Like, you mean when he flipped me off? Yeah, yeah, or, okay, you said yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, he has every right to. And, okay. uh, or, you know, I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make a difference to me whether he flipped me off or not, Yeah. you know? It's, he, he had, he knew at that moment that they had a lot of work cut out for him. Yeah. And that's what I was, I was sorry about two things. One, messing up his car like that, you know, obviously non-intentional, yeah. obviously terrible. And number two, we lost a battle. It's terrible on every account. Yeah. Right? And um, he has every right to be pissed off. Um, you, you know, it, him and I spoke later that night, and he's always been very uh, collected when we talk. And mm -hmm. we talked that night, we've talked after Irvindale, all that. And, you know, it's, I think we both pre understand the the well, we understand what we're doing yeah. you know we're we're rivals and we're both trying to win and personally i think for the sport it's great that <laughs> that we have drivers like matt that that are built in a way where they show emotions like that yeah. i'm just not built that way I <laughs> or i show them in a different way yeah right uh and that's it you know it's it, that mistake was a mistake I was struggling with on the ice. I was pushing a little bit too hard continuously okay. in my practices, uh, you know, off season last year, and it showed its ugly head uh, there. Um, was it, and it's just a shame that it led to all that work for him. Was it one of those moments that happened and you like immediately, like, 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 oh, I should have, like, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Like, I immediately, like, that contact happens and then you're like, I, I knew Absolutely. I was going to do that. Yeah, the, the, the trick with that track is that cars have such different speeds coming out of turn one. Right. And you're hanging out on that outside. Sometimes it's really loose there. Sometimes it's grippy. Some cars are fast. Some cars are slower. It, it, and inches, an, an inch or two different placement makes a big difference in grip there. Yeah. And I, obviously I was going hard and I, I knew I needed to chase him close and I was trying to set up for that dive into turn two, right? And uh, he ended up being slower out of turn one than I anticipated. And yeah. that's, that's what it took. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it, it happened really fast. I mean, it's really easy to go back and analyze all of it now and, and do all that stuff. But at the time, like, if, if you've never been to Long Beach, it is, it's a pinball machine. I mean, I love and hate yeah, it is. that it is the first round. Like, from yeah. a driver's perspective, you're like, oh, cool. Like, I'm coming into this cold. I'm not warmed up. We haven't really tested the car, or the car might have kinks. We're going to put this in the least forgiving track of the season because there is no mistakes. You cannot make a mistake. Um, but from a fan perspective, I'm like, oh, they're cold. They've never <laughs> like, anything can happen, you know. Yeah. And and all it takes is the the smallest mistake there, and that's it. You're rebuilding a car for the rest of the season. So, yep. I, it's I I I I often find myself in that struggle of like wanting to empathize so heavily with the drivers, but also being this super fan of like, I want the best show possible. And, and sometimes we, that comes at the cost of, of the drivers. Yeah, but if we want to grow the sport, we can't, we can't, we, we got to sway more towards making it for the fans. Right. And tracks like that, I totally agree, are epic and what the fans want to see. Yeah. So 
we're modern day gladiators, right? And let's, you know, let's bring it. And we're all taking the risk out there. We all have to go out there being okay with writing the car off and tr trying to deal with that to the best of our ability. And, you know, going into our Long Beach this year, I obviously, I'm going to put that incident into my bag of experiences and try and and obviously avoid it, but at the same time, not hold back. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all know anything can happen at, at any time, and, and, and th that's it. So, so, yeah, coming into this year, like, is there, obviously, you, you spoke to that perspective change. Is there anything else that, that's changing? Whether, I mean, it, it sounds like you guys are still running the Supra, unless, I mean, uh, that being said, I've seen crazy. Sienna minivan. Pardon? How about that? What's that? Sienna minivan. <laughs> You should. Wouldn't that oh my be God. cool? That'd be great. There was a, <laughs> I think it was a Volkswagen van that was drifting at, at Gatbil. That was like. There was. Yeah. yeah he had his own line of beer friends, too. Yeah. I, I had one. It yeah. was pretty good. Um, <laughs> but, but like, is there, is there any different mentality coming in? Like as, you know, champion from the year previous, is there, is there anything that you do different or is it just like hard reset? Nope. Just another year. Just get in there and do what we do. Um, trying to build on last year. Uh, we are doing some minor changes to the car. Okay. We're working with Weissfab on uh, strengthening some of the rear arms and some of the rear knuckles. Weissfab is a great company to work with because they get it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you remember uh, Salt Lake last year when I had a tap on Chelsea, we, we want to make, make the car stronger so you can take hits like that yeah. better. Uh, some minor tuning here and there, uh, nothing, nothing crazy. And then I think this year is just going to be, it's going to keep getting tougher, you know, uh, several new drivers coming in, some of which are, or all of them really strong. Uh, it seems like FD is doing well. There's a lot of hype building. There's a, you know, we're, we're on an upwards tra trajectory with the sport. Uh, so I think it's, it's all going to be badass. I think it's going to be Definitely more difficult for us this year than last year. Uh, a lot of people are learning all the tricks. A lot of other, uh, you know, up and coming teams are doing better and better. Um, you know, it, it's some drivers had an off off se off year mm -hmm. last year a little bit with some tough luck, and you know, OD wasn't in the mix really towards the yeah. end there. But he'll come back. There will be. It'll just keep getting crazier, dude. It's it's yeah. So here's a tough one for you. Um, with several drivers starting to step back, at what point do you start thinking about that? Like, has that even crossed your mind, or are you just like, no, we're, I'm here? Like, Michael Essa for me stepping back was, that was tough. And I went, yeah. okay, this is like, this is now, now we're starting to see, you know, Dai stepping back, um, you know, when Vaughn's retirement. You started seeing that first generation, I guess, of drivers starting to move on. And, and I would put mm -hmm. you in the bank of like the second generation of drivers, right? Um, and then the third gen is obviously kind of like what we're, we're seeing now. You get like Chelsea who's kind of like in between, but it's been around for a long time. So has that ever crossed your mind? Have you started looking at like, what's the long-term goal here? <clears throat> um, yeah, what's, I guess what's the next like 10 years look like for Frederick Osbo? <laughs> 10 years is a long time. I know, uh, okay, we can go, we can go five I, if you want. Like, <laughs> yeah, I... Um, a lot of people ask me this, oh, and damn. I wonder why. Uh, maybe, maybe I've gotten this that old. It, it's <clears throat> it's crossed my mind for ten years. Okay, it's been on my mind for ten years. Um, how long can I do this? How long do I want to do this for? How long can I hang with this? And I've always come back to as long as I I like it and I'm competitive and I can do it, meaning I have the support and the backing and the team and sponsors to do it, mm -hmm. I will do it. Um, but it's, it's not, it, 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 life has a lot to offer beyond just this. So I'm starting to kind of dip my toes in a couple other things, nothing crazy, but some small stuff here and there, business stuff. And, cool. and uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to find myself uh, doing this and not loving it. Right. And and that's all. It's scary, dude. Because it's 
you start the season and you never know what's going to happen. You can really struggle or you can do really well. And if you really struggle, it can be a grind. So I got to commit. When I'm, when I'm in it, I'm in it to, to do my best to win it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, I don't want to. I don't want to start looking, looking too far ahead, and I don't want to really uh, look too deep into and start spending too much time on other things because then I will lose track of what I'm doing now. Right. So I'm confident that as long as I'm healthy, as long as I can stand on, on my own feet, <laughs> I could find some something else to do. So I'm not. I'm not too worried. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe I could take on the role of being a team owner. Steph and I have spoken about maybe I could operate the team. Maybe I could bring on some young guns and be more of a, a crew chief and an operating partner. I, you know, th- I think there's a lot I could help with uh, car setup wise and be spot, be a decent spotter and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so, long story short, I I hope I can do this for as long as I Good. I I want to. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's. Uh, because the sport, I mean, we're we're at twenty years. Like in the grand scheme of business and and you know uh, uh, of racing in general, it's 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 young. So we we haven't yeah. really been able to figure out what the career path is post FD at this point. Like obviously Vaughn built built himself this fantastic group of companies. Um, we see Dai, mm. you know, moving into this other stuff. It looks like Michael's got uh, a really cool setup going on with building some cars, but it's like we're still tr- figuring out like where people go. Tanner moved to other racing. Like what, what becomes the long play? Like where to, you know, you, you've done, you've done stunt driving stuff. So like for me, that seems like a very good way to still be sharp, make some money, but be able to live the rest of your life post FD. Um, yeah. So like, I, that, that's, that's kind of what I'm wondering is like, I, we, we haven't talked a lot about the long, the long game, you know, what, what happens yeah, after FD. I, but all of those things are are sort of relevant to to what we've done in drift. Right. You know that there it just shows that there's a lot of different things we can do, uh, and there are lots of opportunities out there. And the stunt driving, Reese Millen is now the leading Hollywood, uh, at least uh, the commercial yeah. precision driver in the world. Personally, I don't particularly love the stunt driving and the precision driving for for films and commercials because it's it, it's it's always here's the car. This is what we got. Do your best. That's uh, okay. not what I like. I'm not. I don't. I don't enjoy the driving mostly. I enjoy the package of working out the car, setting up the car, working with the team, trying to get the most out of that particular vehicle. So I'm more, much more of a racing guy than a film film guy. Okay. I and I'm a big fan of short course truck racing. Big fan of rallycross. Maybe I could try my hand on, on some of those um, categories. But but um, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to bring up a kid. There's some really good drivers out there that deserve to get a spot in in FD over the next five ten years. Yeah, I, I actually brought up um, when recording with Lantane uh, Nick Knack. Where I'm like, yeah. I had I had no idea who he was, and then and then obviously you know being around other Norwegians, I just you, know, you have to see, you have to see, and I'm like, okay, and it, it, yeah. I I do think that right now, probably some of the, the the greatest drivers in drifting we may never hear of. I mean, this is the case with with a lot sure. of stuff where it's like, yeah, there's these kids who either don't have the budget for it or don't have the exposure to it that could be like the next great driver, and it's just mm-hmm. a matter of you know, finding, finding them. Like, how do we, I guess like as a, as a drifting culture, like how do we do that? How do we ensure that these people don't get missed? It starts with them. They have to pour everything they have into it. And, you know, but, but like you said, it's like the, the best soccer player is probably on the streets of Brazil, right? It's, it's, it's that same thing. So, it goes back to, to them putting in the effort first, first to get on the scene. And sometimes that's hard, you know? Yeah. Like, like you said, a lot of those the money is definitely an issue because it's so expensive what we do. So I, I hope this, the, the series and the sport can get to a point where there's more sponsorships available and it's spread out more and it's a healthy, viable life for more people. Mm-hmm. and. You know, FD, FD has 
come a long way since the start. We have a lot of new, a lot of new faces, a lot, much more viewership, much more of a lot of things. But at the same time, there's less manufacturers involved. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep bringing those back in? How do we keep bringing the big names in to help grow everything? I, I don't, I don't have the answer, but I, I want to be a part of making that happen. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, it's it's very difficult to. Uh, not, I wouldn't say like pitch the sport, but like get people to understand what is happening because it doesn't conform to what most racing is, and um, right. you know it's it's just it's 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 a difficult thing to do in general is is just to take somebody who has no knowledge of drifting and be like here is why you should be excited about this here is why you want to do it and and a lot of it's just getting people involved. I remember. Uh, even still, just like explaining to my dad, like my involvement with the sport, and he's like, "Oh yeah, that's kind of cool." And like, I remember showing him, and then it clicked. And he's like, "Oh, this is this is like incredible." I'm like, "Yeah, like mm -hmm. this." Once you experience it, it's it's very difficult to watch other forms yeah. of racing. And the reason why something like F1 becomes so popular, because arguably the racing's not all that exciting, is becomes the stories, becomes the tales that we tell, and and more or less the drama and the, and the back end, the rumor mills, like that's, for me as an F1 fan, that's where I get my excitement from. Like, I'll still get up yeah. at three o'clock in the morning to watch a race, but like, that's not when I'm the most excited about the sport. Totally. So I think maybe that's, maybe that, and I guess me doing this now is, is me trying to get that yep. going, is to take yeah. that obsession I have and try and get other people involved in the same way and, you know, maybe poke the rumor mill a little bit, get some information out of people and get people excited about the sport outside of the weekend. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. And, and hopefully hey, that I, trickles to companies. Yeah. I, I think the most fascinating thing about F1 and that Drive to Survive series is when you learn that in this billion dollar industry, all these dudes are just regular people that they're just guys like us. Yeah. And 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 I think uh, you know some some of the cool cooler moments I've I've experienced in drifting has been just that when obviously what we do is in a much much smaller scale than F1. Yeah. But when these fans come up and they're like, "Yeah, you're just a normal guy." I'm like, "Yeah." You know, <laughs> what did you expect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's yeah, I it's cool. It's cool when you see stuff like that happening. Do you do you still like how do you how do you deal with that? Like how do you deal with the 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 knowledge that you are one of the most renowned drifting drivers in the world? Like do, I I mean, have you had was there a moment when you went, "Oh shit, like th this is this is who I am" or like you I cuz you're very humble. You're incredibly humble. But like did did you have a moment when you're like, "Oh, uh, this is what I'm doing now?" Or is it just a slow creep? <laughs> slow creep. Yeah. And I, yes, I'm humble and I believe in being humble and I'm raised to be humble mm -hmm. and I, it's, I, I like to live that way. But if but. you ask people that know me well, <laughs> I have my moments too. I can be, if we have something to celebrate, I can be cocky and maybe I can be, I'm, Maybe I'm confident in a, in a strange way. Okay, you know, it's maybe not always out outspoken, but I'm confident in the little things that I uh, that I know that I can do. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's I, I think that puzzles some people that they're like, but you you come across as like this jerk or or you look like a douchebag or this or that, and they talk to me and they're like, you're actually kind and interested. They it doesn't match up, but I. I don't know. I, in my head, I'm still just a small town kid from, from where I grew up here in yeah. Norway, and I I love the times when I get to play the underdog, and okay. you know I don't get to play that in FD anymore, and that's I, that's one of the tougher things for me to deal with because now there's all these expectations and this and that. I, I I I like to be on the upwards trajectory and like being a guy that maybe perhaps people don't expect too much from. That's why I love driving around in Sweden with my beat up ice car <laughs> on the trailer of my old Toyota van yeah. and show up at these random ice tracks with no where people don't know me and try and take some scalps, you know? 
Well, it, it's there, there's that really common phrase like "heavy is the head that wears the crown." Like what? And, or or mm. it's lonely at the top. Like once you get there, it's like what? Once this is your ceiling, where do we where do yeah. we go from here? Right. After our first championship, I had a re- reaction like that. Yeah. I was like, I, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to come back. Really? After we won our first championship. I was so, like, my, the, the previous 15 years, all I wanted, my big, big dream in life was to compete in FD. And I didn't even dare to dream about winning an FD championship. But that was there. That was deep. With, it was my core. Yeah. And once it happened, I was so, like deflated mm. like I celebrated for three months and found the love of my <laughs> wife and traveled the world and did you know did uh, and when I came back I was like what's left like what's what do I do now yeah I mean and and, and ob- the obvious answer is try and win more but it's like it'll never feel the same as the first one and uh but I mean you're now I guess on the precipice of of you have the opportunity right now to become the most the, the the driver with the most championships like is that the next goal like is that become the next thing the the next you know mountain to climb yes has that even like crossed your mind because like it seemed like you you just kind of thought about it there and you're like oh yeah I guess, no, I guess right. absolutely <laughs> of course of course it has yeah 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 it's not it's I'm a numbers guy and of course it yeah. has uh, and it would be fantastic and great and all that and we're definitely going for it and we're pushing for it. Uh, but, but more so, the the motivation is more so to try and fine tune and 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 compare ourselves to these other drivers out there. That's okay. more the motivation actually than winning. Hmm. The, the, I, you know, I my first trophies, I I I've, I've, I was really proud of them, and I remember coming home to mom and giving them to mom and like putting them on the table, like being really proud and all that. After the, then after a while, when we got more and more trophies, I was, they meant, the trophies meant less and less. Um, and now it's more about, it. I keep coming back to that nerdy tinkering on the car, trying some setup stuff, working with the team, sending some ideas to Steph, him responding, him figuring something out. That's the drive. Hmm. That's to drive more the, than anything else. More the pursuit of perfection as opposed to like yeah. the actual win itself. Like the the win yeah. will happen if everything is perfect. Exactly. Hmm. That's interesting. That's it's just it's just an interesting mindset. I mean, it it it's very difficult for somebody like me to understand where your head's at, right? That's and and, and that's I guess right. what I'm trying to do is just worm my way in there to get, like to figure yeah, this yeah. out because yeah. it's so foreign for so many people, right? I mean, it's foreign yeah. for literally everybody who hasn't won three championships. Yeah. Right? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you don't know. I, it, 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 I, I think you, like, do you, do you suffer from imposter syndrome at all? Do you, do you know, do you, like, do you know what that Oh, that what means? is that? Imposter what syndrome is, is um, well, very similar to how I'm feeling now, uh, where you, you, you're in a moment and and you feel very much like you don't deserve to be there or like this isn't me. Like I don't know who this guy is that I am right now because this isn't me. Like I'm some some guy who started a YouTube channel years and years ago that just worked his way into this position and the next thing I know, you and I are hanging out recording a podcast for a series that I followed religiously for years. So for me, I have to battle mm. this imposter syndrome like this isn't me. This isn't Jacob. Like, why is who's this guy that's doing this podcast right now? Like, do do you ever okay. get that where you're like, like, no, I'm not a I'm not a champion, or like, you know, I I'm not, you know, at this level. Has that maybe I, yeah, like okay. So moment that sticks out in time for me is in 2011. We won the our first international big competition in mm-hmm. Abu Dhabi. It was the Formula Drift Invitational at Yas Marina, yeah. the epic F1 track. The incredible track. And we, and you know, eight, eight of the top FD teams were invited. We were showing up with, with you know, an old Supra we shipped, shipped from Norway with my some of my close friends. And we went was it down Chucky? there and it was- Or different, different Supra? Was, different Supra, okay. so it was not technically Chucky, but similar. Okay. And, uh, we qualified last, and it was just an epic venue, right? Like after every 
practice lap, they were out there painting the rumble strips uh, red and white again. Wow. And all these, you know, we had the, we, we were in the F1 uh, garages next to the track, and we were just a bunch of dorks, you know, just trying our best. We ended up winning that event. And after that event, we were at the yacht club of Yas Marina <laughs> behind the F1 garage where they parked the yachts. And I remember Tanner was in the corner smoking hookah, and we had uh, <laughs> dwarfs serving Grey Goose vodka out of bottles that were taller than themselves. Wow. And we were, it was just like, I remember like sitting there and like, this is pretty surreal. You know, like, yeah. like, like being here and among these people and, you know, there were, there were no limits to anything really, you know, it, it was, I've had, it was a weird moment where I'm, we were just there to compete and try and make this old car work and, and it worked and now we're here and we're being celebrated and, yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's the same, but some of those moments are very, they, the, those moments are make me pinch myself. And yeah. It all it also kind of makes me question: Do I really kind of do I deserve this? I, okay. Yeah. Know? No, you're you're right there. You're that that is a hundred percent imposter syndrome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, I just so I guess I I, yeah, I guess it's it. happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, one thing that I do notice a lot. So here in Scandinavia, we have something. It's like a norm or like an unwritten rule for people. It's called janteloven, jantes law. Okay. What it means is you're not supposed to stick out. Mm. That's why you see a lot of Scandinavians in Stockholm. We all wear black. Yeah. We all, we're all kind of a little bit shy and reserved and not too outspoken. And uh, if you stick out too much, it's some people will kind of look at you. You're you're a little bit strange. Uh, it's very opposite of the American culture. So my wife, being from San Diego, she doesn't have that. She's to, she's like, if she knows she's good at something, she will flaunt it. She will almost brag about it. She'll talk about it mm-hmm. with no, without feeling bad about it. You know, she'll and if she does well in a competition, she drifts too. She's like, what's next? Yeah. That, to her, there's no limit. Whereas to me, I'm like, if I've done well, I'm like, okay, I can step back a li- little bit, you know, like let someone else try. She doesn't have that barrier. And that's something that I, that is fascinating to me, seeing hmm. how different cultures are. That's it. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's really interesting. It, it, it It's fun to understand that and then see how that plays into what I guess your personality is now and how, and how you hold yourself and how you communicate and, and how you choose to publicly display who you are. Um, because right. I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm one of those people I've, I've, I've seen, you know, signs of, of the party Osbo and, and I've seen you in a, uh, in a way that wasn't being publicly presented. And, and I know that sure. there's, there's a little bit there. I mean, you'll always be yourself. Um, I guess a good example of this is people talk about being on YouTube or being on camera. And it's it's not that you're not yourself. You're just yourself plus 10%. That it, sure. It's you, but you just have to be a bit more because, you know, the camera loses something. So yeah. I, I know from, I, I know a little bit of like understanding of, of what you're like, I guess, behind closed doors to then see it come out in public. And you, and, there, and there's a glimpse of it. And, and I've seen it in interviews where that like competitive edge will come through and, and there'll be like a small word or a small phrase or you can see it in your body where you're having to hold back that little bit just to be like, okay, I'm in an interview. I really want to swear right now. I really want to scream and like do stuff. And and, and it's happened too. Like you can see it. You're shaking. You're, you're in an yeah. interview with Lorette and you're like, ah, like I just want to yell. Um, but it seems to be, it, it's almost that, I cannot pronounce what you said, uh, but <laughs> that uh, doesn't overshadow it, but that kind of comes in your mind. You're like, okay, just... Hang on a second, like you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go too crazy here. I, I'm. I still have this thing I need to present, uh, but I'm still feeling this way, and and it's like this. Sure. This thin mask that's over top of what's trying to break through. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not trying to like psychoanalyze you on a podcast or anything. Yeah. It's just I, same thing. I'm. I'm. I'm trying to really understand, you know, where the reputation of of you know Frederick Osbo the robot comes from, right, and. And and it seems to be partially a choice, and but also partially like a cultural thing. 
of, of sure. oh, this is this is how I was raised. This is how I was taught. So to to try and completely remove that is not necessarily easy. And and you also seem to kind of choose to not remove that as well. Yeah, it, it, it's. I I think it's a lot simpler than perhaps a lot of people think. I I. I just want to compete and I just want to do well and 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 for me all the extra all the extra stuff doesn't help being more competitive. Mm. So I just try when we've if we've found a good rhythm and have found a good way of of competing then I'll just try and stick to that. It's and but the downside is that that is boring. It's not that exciting. Everybody loves a a top athlete that's out there and and calling names or, or like <laughs> yeah. calling out people Being and creating drama and, and yeah. stir. People love that more. I'm people, yeah, people love that. I'm just not like that. Yeah. I it I don't get personally. I don't get any more joy out of that. And I instead I feel like it just puts more pressure on me and it just jinxes myself and I. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I'm just I'm there to try and let my driving do the talking, and if it goes well, you'll find fa- you'll find the the more you'll 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 find what you're looking for at the party later at night. <laughs> I like that. Okay, before before we wrap up, I want to I want to ask: Do you have a good story of like early days? Early attrition. I mean, I remember Chris Forsberg talking on a podcast about like sleeping in his car to like get to events and like not having enough money to come back. And uh, is there? Do you have a good one of those? Like a real early <laughs> day? Maybe nobody's heard before. You don't talk about. Um, yeah. So my first event in the U.S. was in 08, the okay. World Championship um, in Long Beach, out on Terminal Island. We were not good enough. Uh, to be a part of those 32 invited teams. But I tried to sell my, myself to FD, so I made a pitch. Um, and I had three years of business school at the time, and I, I tried to put all the highlights in that pitch and send it, sent it to Jim, and he ended up inviting me. And this I have spoken about before, but I got that email that read, Freddie, pack your bags, see you in Long Beach. Oh, that's and that's cool. when we first got, got to the US. Ship the car. We did pretty well at that first event, uh, top 16, best Euro team. Came back the year after in 2009 um, for, uh, to try our hand at Irmingdale and failed miserably. And at that point in 2009, I was, I, I, uh, my job, I lost my job in Norway. So I got a little bit of like an, a lump sum out of that. I was on welfare in Norway. I moved back in with my parents. My good friend Moy moved back in with me. And we were like, okay, we tried our we tried our luck in the US now and failed miserably. What what do we do? So that winter, 09 through and into 2010, he, we sat up at night studying drifting, watching drifting at my little room at my parents' place. Really try to understand the sport. We put out almost like a like an ad at a Supra forum in the States okay. to see if there was a partner shop that would work with us, uh, the great race team out of Norway. Um, and this little shop in, in East LA bit, FSR Motorsport. And uh, Ian and Eric over there, they were like, okay, come on over, come in prior to Long Beach. We'll take the car in, we'll service it. You'll work for us and we'll see what we can do. So Moy and I flew over there the cheapest tickets, had no money. We we checked in together at this rundown kind of drug dealing motel <laughs> down the street. And we Perfect. didn't have any money, so we slept in the same bed. You know, we, we, we didn't have money to opt for the two beds. And it was just a, a rough time. I was selling parts on eBay. He was re- wrenching on their customer cars. And we went to Long Beach with big hopes and dreams. And... After, that, that was, it was kind of like we were all in at that point. If we had failed at that event in Long Beach in 2010, I probably would have been gone. I wouldn't have made it in drifting. That event, we ended up knocking out Chris Forsberg. We uh, got all the way to top four 
And so a lot of fans claim that we should have won that ba- battle. But regardless, we were the moral winner of that event, it felt like. Everyone yeah. was cheering for us. We were kind of the champion killer and we're coming in fresh and new and different and hopes and dreams, right? That was the turning point. And that's when, you know, we started getting the sponsorships and electronic arts. And, but it took, it, it, it was like putting everything on the line everything on the line and and made some friends for life up there at FSR Motorsport Creations and created an absolute havoc in Long Beach later that night because we knew that now we're on a roll now. We're on a roll. And we won the Rookie of the Year title that year and what do they say? The rest is history. But that year was, it was epic. And sometimes I wish I could go back and be, you know, 20... 22 years old again and 23 or whatever I was and relive it because being it felt like it felt like being like a, a gold digger in the in the Klondike you know yeah it was it was it was an epic memory you didn't you didn't know how it would at the time you had no idea what what it was setting up but even uh, even if we had failed after that we got that one milestone in the books right and even if we had failed after that I would have been happy because we got to go up against the best. Ah, that's so good. Uh, th- you know what? I, I, I think I'm going to end it there. That, that is, it, for anybody out there that's, that's struggling in drifting, there's, you want your inspiration, you want your, you know, your sign to keep pushing and, and keep doing it and, and figure it out. And you know, not that you have to sleep yeah. in a dingy motel room, but I mean, hey, we've all done it. I know I have. You probably have to at some point. I, th- I think it's like a character building thing. Like you just, yeah. you, you just have to have that like checked off and like, okay, now I can move on from there. So, yeah. Freddie, thank you so much for this. Um, thank you. Wh- where can everybody find you? I mean, if they don't already know where to find you, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Where's the best place? Yeah. Where do you interact the most? <laughs> uh, trying to build my TikTok. Having some fun on TikTok right Ooh, now. Okay. Um, but you know, obviously on on Instagram and Facebook, not so much Twitter anymore. Okay, there seems to be a lot of craziness there. It's a little um, weird. Yeah, but TikTok. Um, some people have asked me if I'm on Grinder. Not yet. We'll see later. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm happily married. But where you can definitely find me is on the frozen lakes in Sweden. Yeah. Over the next couple of weeks. Well, I won't. I won't hold you up any longer. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we got to do this, even though it's was super early for me, but it was 100 percent worth Thank it. Thank you. So.